Okay, thank you very much. So um, thank you for having me and thank you for the flexibility to reschedule. Um, that's very nice um, of you, uh, first of all. Um, so I was asked to talk on the economics of renewable and traditional energy, and I decided to give you somehow a roadshow on my research um, agenda in uh, this respect uh, on some past research, um, on some present research, and in particular um, I think um, I have to mention um, that this research is first uh, very interdisciplinary by now, so I started out as an economist, uh, but uh, in uh, the field of energy, it uh, became more and more clear that you need to um, work first with the engineers to somehow understand uh, where things are developing, um, not because it is so important that we um, understand very much about particular technologies, but rather because we have to understand how we design markets um, that give enough room uh, for technological developments. Um, and um, in energy policy, of course, there's always um, uh, a tradition to do things um, by adjusting the framework, for example, CO2 pricing, but there's also a broad tradition to do very technological specific policies. And um, if you evaluate them, you have to understand what it's about, what is the impact, what is the potential impact of certain technologies on the economy um, and uh, whether you want it. I mean, as economists, uh, you very often prefer technology, uh, technology neutral policies that give the best technology um, the, uh, the chance um, to, uh, to, to be established. So uh, this is um, work with um, engineers. Uh, it is work with mathematicians uh, because we, uh, by now build models um, that also um, enable us to calibrate them with real data. It's a little bit like in macroeconomics, but uh, in, the, in the energy um, dimension. Um, so um, we also work a lot with mathematicians in order to make uh, the model solvable, to um, model markets and networks jointly in the same model in order to get a little bit more insight. Um, and it's, of course, um, some of it is uh, being done in the context of policy consulting. So um, uh, Cora just mentioned I'm in the um, German Council of Economic Experts. Uh, so we are consulting um, the government uh, on uh, the overall economic issues, but I'm also in the commission uh, that focuses in particular on energy topics, on energy markets. And uh, that's also what a lot of research is um, dealing with. Um, first, I think what I learned in all these years is uh, that we have to focus very much on the fact in our research um, that um, climate neutrality is really a global issue. So um, if you look here at the uh, development of global em emissions up to now and from now on, you see that it's still increasing and that very important countries, very um, high emission countries um, will still increase uh, their emissions in the near future. So we do not only need to think about um, national uh, or European mechanisms of climate protection, Protection, but also how they fit into uh, the global framework of um, climate protection. Um, and there are very interesting interconnections that, of course, in the policy consulting work we account for. Um, so another thing is um, that if you look at this picture, um, it is clear that no single country uh, can uh, save the climate. And in particular, it is uh, very unlikely that with only public investment, even if you increase it by a lot, uh, you will not save the climate. You need to trigger pri private investment. And therefore, uh, market design is very important. In Germany, for example, um, public investment is 10% of total investment in the economy. And that makes clear that we have to mobilize private investment to a large extent. Um, what have, has become clear in the recent years, um, at the latest since uh, the Green Deal, is that sector coupling will be very important. So we need um, electricity, but we also need mole molecules. Uh, so on the one hand, um, 
climate protection will happen by electrifying a lot of things. Therefore, decarbonization of the electricity sector is very important because then you can also decarbonize heat, you can decarbonize industry, uh, mobility, but a lot of things you cannot do with electricity. Um, and there you need hydrogen and hydrogen-based energy carriers. And in order to understand what this means for market design, we have to understand how these two um, strengths of sector coupling um, interact. And most likely it's very related because um, hydrogen will also be used, for example, to fuel gas power plants. In Germany, uh, this at least is a plan. And so there's a close interaction between the two. And I think market design is very important. And it's very important to understand how we have to shape market design in order to make it going. Um, uh, a third issue is that um, we uh, look, of course, at sustainability issues. A lot of research in energy is also research on sustainability. We want to get uh, the energy system climate neutral, um, but um, we also have to look at um, other dimensions of sustainability. Uh, we have to look at fiscal sustainability. Um, men, very often it is promoted that we just have to spend a lot of public money um, on um, ecological issues, on climate um, protection. But um, of course we have to see that uh, climate neutrality, that's a long path. It's like a marathon um, where you have to um, enable, we have to, where you have to have a government that is able to support climate protection for the next 20 years or 25 years. And therefore, of course, fiscal sustainability, so the ability of the state to act uh, will be very important throughout all these years. So we have to be very careful um, not to endanger fiscal sustainability. And I think this becomes now particularly clear um, when the interest rates are rising due to inflation. Uh, it becomes very clear that this is really an issue. Uh, and also social uh, sustainability without convincing the people, um, I think climate policy cannot be successful. And many of the measures that we propose, many of the market designs that we propose, of course, uh, affect um, the budgets of the people. Um, and we have to see that, of course, these people that are affected, for example, by CO2 pricing, um, these are voters, and we will only, only uh, be able um, to implement policies as if also the voters are in favor of certain policies. So um, this is something that at least in Germany and also in Europe is discussed a lot in the context of CO2 pricing. CO2 pricing is very effective to protect the climate, but if the people don't want it, then we will not be able to, um, to implement it. Um, it. I already mentioned interdisciplinarity. So these are all, all, all these issues um, have to be accounted for. And our research basically started um, with an interest in investment uh, decisions in electricity markets. So typically, a, a lot of research is on short-term electricity trading on market power and electricity markets, but it's very rarely, it has been very, very rarely um, looked at what are the investment incentives in capacity, in generation capacity for uh, power plants and uh, in network capacity for the transmission of electricity. Um, what are the incentives induced by the market design? And of course, uh, the investment incentives um, uh, that firms have into capacity, into building a power plant, are very different if you have, for example, a uniform electricity price um, all over the place in one country, or if you have nodal pricing and uh, the price is um, locational. So where you have a li li little capacity and a lot of demand, there the price is higher and vice versa. Of course, this affects investment incentives um, particularly, and uh, this is also um, um, this is also the reason why typically um, optimization models that um, find out what the optimal electricity system look, look, looks like um, they give you an an impression where you want to end up probably. Uh, but typically, um, this allocation is not what is implemented if you let the markets 
decide. Uh, and this is just because in Europe, for example, we have um, market areas divided into price zones. We have very big price zones. Typically, one country is one price zone. Some countries have more price zones than one. But um, in Germany, for example, or in France, or in other countries, um, the same electricity price uh, holds on the spot market in every hour for the whole country. And of course, uh, this, um, this incentivizes firms to invest in regions where you would like to have investment, where generation capacity is scarce and demand is high. And um, this is something we developed uh, models for. We developed models that are able to look at these markets where typically network investment is planned by the government or planned by uh, the European Commission and then uh, implemented by and by, and um, generation investment is, um, is decided on by private firms. And our models uh, just try to uh, implement this situation in an electricity market model where the regulator, so to say, um, invests in network capacity and the firms invest in um, generation capacity in a country. And then you can calibrate these models and look at different electricity markets. Uh, we calibrated it mostly with respect to Germany, but we also have some applications with respect to European issues. Um, so this is basically how the model uh, works. We have a multi-level um, model where um, the different um, decision makers um, take decisions um, anticipating um, later decisions at the spot market or later decisions by other investors. Um, and basically what we model is the following. We have um, a regulator um, who decides on issues that typically the regulator decides on. And in uh, our implementations, it's on the one hand um, network capacity so the regulator can design the network. And uh, when he takes these decisions, these are long run decisions in Germany, it lasts a lot of time. And also in the European Union, it takes a lot of time to um, expand uh, the, the uh, transmission network for electricity. Um, and these decisions are taken in anticipation of um, the electricity system of of the generations mix that uh, you expect to be there in the future. Um, and in the model, um, generation capacity is decided on by firms at a further level. And then after the network and generation capacity has been built, uh, we assume that electricity trading on a spot market takes place for uh, a number of hours. You can calibrate these models. For example, you can calibrate them and look at a type year in the far future and um, look what uh, would be uh, the investment in generation capacity and in network capacity um, if you anticipate um, a certain demand structure and a certain uh, and certain spot market rules. And in the model, you can you can modify uh, the spot market rules. For example, we can modify um, the price zone configuration. We can modify whether it's a nodal pricing or a zonal pricing model, and so on. So, if you have questions on this, uh, just uh, raise your hand and ask. Um, uh, so that's uh, the model structure in principle. And then we can um, look at this as a first three level model. Um, and if you have um, at the trading stage at the spot markets, if you have such a uniform price system as you have it in many European states, then it is clear uh, that if you trade uh, nationwide at a uniform price at the spot market, of course, um, the allocation that comes out of this spot market trading might not be feasible on the network. So typically you have a further stage um, where the network operator has to redispatch um, quantities um, and adjust slightly in order to make the allocation going on the network. So that's 
how typically European um, electricity markets work. And so we implement it in a model. Uh, this becomes a three level model if you write it down completely, and then you can reduce it to a B level model by um, combining certain levels to um, joint levels. Um, and um, then we um, develop algorithms um, how to solve these models. And there we have a few papers uh, that look at different algorithms and that work out quite well. And we test um, how um, powerful are they, how, how are the running times and so on. That's uh, rather uh, the mathematician's um, research agenda uh, to make uh, these models solvable uh, for a very uh, for for very big networks um, that they uh, that they run on. Um, so um, what can we do basically um, with these models? Now, for example, if you look at Germany now, we could look at uh, the network expansion planning in Germany. There has be there has been and still is a big debate on um, the network expansion of the transmission power grid um, because we have a lot of renewables potential in the north of Germany and we have um, a lot of demand for electricity in the south of Germany. So basically, if um, there will be much more renewable production in the north, uh, the question is um, under which framework conditions do we manage uh, to um, make it make the whole system going um, under which framework condition uh, we get an allocation of um, production of generation capacities that will have to be installed um, that um, enable the whole system to supply the demand in the south how do we have to position the renewable energy plants can we uh, locate them mostly in the north or do we have to spread them across the country um, because um, otherwise we could not uh, serve the whole system and what does this mean for the decision to um to expand the network. And um, just to illustrate, um, so, so we, we calibrated our model with data for the German electricity market, and then uh, we were able to illustrate, for example, that um, for the optimal solution, um, you need um, much less ca network capacity than um, for a solution that will occur if you if you um, will get um, the investment decisions um, that are um, implied by the current market design. So the current market design is a market design where you get the same um, price for electricity all over Germany. So it's very unattractive. Um, so, so basically, um, if that is the case, you would install plants, you would build power plants where it is um, the cheapest production site and this for renewables, for example, is in the north. So you will have a concentration of production capacities in the north of Germany. And this implies that you will need much more network capacity to transport all this power into the south than in an optimal system where you would um, solve the trade-off differently and build some plants in the south as well, some renewable power plants in the, in the south as well, where there's less wind um, uh, but therefore, in global optimum, you would save on transmission capacity. So basically, markets uh, get a different result um, than um, the um, overall optimum. And I think we have to uh, account for this and to anticipate this um, when we uh, do policy um, consulting. And uh, of course, uh, policy has to anticipate this, this if they do their network planning. So um, we can uh, then uh, look at different issues with these models. For example, we could look at um, optimal price zones. Um, and um, we have written some paper, papers in this respect. Um, so I already touched um, on the optimal um, renewable energy locations. And uh, basically, this is, of course, an issue that can matter a lot because it, um, the question is whether you have a mechanism where you um, implement an incentive to locate all of it in the, in the north of Germany, where the 
where there's a lot of wind and also where there's a lot of space in order to install the plants. And then you have to install a lot of network capacity or you implement a mechanism where you also um, in, induce incentives in order to um, locate plants more in the south. And um, this can be addressed uh, also with the model. And then we can uh, look at how would you uh, shape um, auctions that um, how, how, how should you shape auctions for renewable energy plants in Germany, as in many other countries, you um, auction off the right to build the plant and you auction off the remuneration of the plant if it's um, the same overall over the whole country, um, then of course you will get the most plants where um, the wind is uh, blowing um, most and the most solar plants where the sun is shining the most. Um, but you can of course shape these auctions and adjust uh, the incentives in the auctions um, such that um, the supply, uh, the installation of plant matches better um, the demand at the different in the different uh, regions of a country um, and this of course um, reduces the need to expand network capacity um, another issue that is um, quite important for policy is um, that there's very often a lot of regulatory uncertainty so um, if you um, think about adjusting uh, the rules at the electricity market, you could, for example, have um, a spot market um, regulation where you have uh, the same price all over the country and possibly different prices uh, between different European countries. You could also have um, rules where you split countries into different price zones as it has been done, for example, in Sweden. Um, there uh, you have different prices in different uh, regions of the same country. And this, of course, induces a certain um, incentive to install uh, more capacity in the high priced um, areas. Um, and um, what is um, inherent to, uh, to policy is that there's always some discussion about these measures and there's some uncertainty whether you will have a spot market with um, one zonal price or whether you will have a spot market with multiple price zones or you will probably have a switch to a nodal pricing system where you have a different price at each node um, that um, also accounts uh, for the situation at the different at the at this location, and that also uh, accounts for the network capacity constraints um, that are inherent in the transmission network. So, um, what you can do with these models in this structure that I just um, pointed out some slides ago, um, you could induce, uh, you could look at this situation um, that the investment decisions in network capacity and in um, generation capacity are taken uh, under uncertainty in which specific market regulation you will end up trading electricity. And then, um, of course, uh, depending on the specific situation, you can uh, look at whether this uncertainty um, can be um, deterring, can deter investments. Um, so that the situation, this uncertainty would, in, in the end, uh, deter investment, drive up prices, or whether uh, this discussion, this policy discussion about the market design of the spot market can also um, increase um, effective or efficient investment. And both can happen, and you can look at this um, in, uh, again, if you calibrate these models. Uh, specifically, um, we had in Germany and in some countries in the European Union, we had a discussion on price zones. And um, in particular, this discussion on price zone, if um, the investors find it likely uh, that this will be um, emerging, then it becomes more attractive um, to install power plants at locations um, where um, there's a lot of demand up to now and little generation capacity because with certain probability, of course, uh, it could be that you will benefit from higher prices in these areas. 
And uh, this will take place, although um, it uh, must not happen, it must not be implemented with probability one. So uh, this discussion somehow will have some effect on the installation of additional capacity. But of course, you have to see that then once uh, the uncertainty um, unravels, and uh, for example, uh, multiple price zones are then implemented, then the additional effect might not be that big because there are already these anticipatory effects uh, that already moved uh, capacity investment into these areas. So on the one hand, this uncertainty induces more investment in um, areas where you want it, but the actual decision, if you would evaluate then uh, what happened um, slightly before um, the regulatory decision took place and slightly um, after the regulatory decision took place, if you would compare these two situations, you may not find so much of a difference in investment activities because a lot of investment already took place um, anticipating this decision and therefore took already place before the decision actually was implemented. So um, this was um, research that we did uh, for a long time. So that was basically uh, models that we built uh, within the last 10 years and then implemented and published uh, quite a lot of papers on it. Um, and um, then there came the decision um, on climate neutrality in the European Union. And basically before the climate neutrality uh, decision in the German um, energy discussion, and I think this was also the, the issue at the European level, was um, that um, we can electrify a lot, and there are some uh, hard to electrify um, issue industries, for example, um, or also heavy mobility. Um, and um, in a 90% climate neutrality scenario, um, many of these players thought, ah, then I am among the ones who can still emit. Yeah, if you have 10% of emissions that can be still emitted in the scenario where you go into, um, then uh, typically you have the effect that all the uh, industries are lobbying to be among the ones who are exempted from the um, uh, decarbonization um, initiatives. Um, and so, and this, of course, this window was closed with the decision on 100% climate neutrality. And what, and the situation that we face since then is that we need to um, generate renewable electricity, basically, and then use this renewable electricity directly or indirectly in order to decarbonize heat, mobility industry, power storage. And um, directly is of course electrification and indirectly is uh, via hydrogen. So you generate renewable hydrogen from um, renewable electricity by electrolysis um, and then use this renewable hydrogen or a power fuel based on this renewable hydrogen to decarbonize industry applications that you cannot electrify, mobility applications that you cannot electrify, or even uh, substitute heat, heat um, applications that you do not want or, do, or cannot electrify. And also in the power sector, we will need uh, some hydrogen if a um, electricity system is based um, on um, renewables and gas turbines, then certainly uh, the gas turbines in a climate neutral world will be fired with hydrogen. And so since uh, this, since what, it was clear that this would become a very important topic, uh, we started to assess what this means, um, especially in terms of cost. And um, the first issue that one could become interested in is to identify um, those um, uh, those um, applications and plants in the industry that um, will need hydrogen in the far future. So in a climate neutral um, economy in Germany, 
you have a lot of plants in the glass industry, lime, cement, paper, steel, ammonia, methanol production, uh, where you will have to substitute fossil energy carriers by hydrogen and the um, left picture is some minimum um, scenario. If you keep all the industrial plants in Germany, then this would be the hydrogen demand uh, in Germany. And um, the right hand side picture is the upper bound scenario. So you see there's a certain, um, there's quite some, quite a range. Um, so, and the difference is um, the potential for electrification in these industries. But it's really a huge quantity of hydrogen that will have to be supplied to Germany or will have to be produced in Germany. So the next question would be, um, if you look at these, um, at these industries, um, what will happen? Um, do, will they receive hydrogen and just substitute fossil um, energy carriers by hydrogen in their production processes, or will they receive um, some product that is further processed? For example, in the ammonia production, you can either import hydrogen and do and then produce ammonia from it um, in the industrialized country, or you produce uh, or you import um, ammonia and just substitute um, ammonia production in the um, industrialized, industrialized country by an ammonia import. And of course, one uh, implies, uh, one case implies that you um, keep the value chain uh, in the European Union, and the other case implies that you will lose uh, the value chain in the European Union. And you can look at these industries and in various, various in, in the different industries, um, there are um, different steps um, uh, along these value chains where you would see that it is very likely that this is um, the, um, uh, this is the energy carrier that is finally imported into the European Union. And um, if you then look at these um, uh, potentials, um, then I already uh, illustrated that ammonia uh, might be something that you will import into the uh, European Union. Your ammonia is basically produced from um, hydrogen. In the fossil world, you make hydrogen from fossil gas and then uh, produce it further uh, to get ammonia. Um, but in the renewable world, you will produce uh, renewable hydrogen at um, attractive locations for production of renewable hydrogen worldwide and then possibly transport it and ammonia is already traded uh, to a very large extent here you see the today's um, ammonia market and this is really uh, a full-fledged market already uh, there are 200 existing terminals wor worldwide for ammonia trade 170 vessels for ammonia transport and um, nevertheless ammonia is largely produced today in the country of its usage, only 12% of the um, global ammonia production is traded. So this will be uh, basically the first energy carrier that uh, drives us into a renewable hydrogen world. So the molecule-based molecule um, energy supply also to the European Union will start by importing um, ammonia and um, will not end there but uh, sorry and uh, here uh, it comes to uh, some other research that we've been doing um, then we were interested in the question in what form and from where um, will we import hydrogen in the future and um, this is a more difficult question so it's quite clear if you look at the industrial structure in the European Union and if you look at today's um, trade of hydrogen-based energy carriers, then you see very quickly that it is ammonia that will be traded first. Um, but there are a lot of developments, and this is something where uh, we started uh, cooperating with engineers. Uh, there are a lot of um, um, energy carriers uh, that are based on hydrogen or that carry hydrogen uh, well, uh, that could potentially uh, be 
energy carriers for hydrogen imports to Europe in the future. Um, from which countries uh, is it likely that it comes from? Now from countries uh, that have high potential of renewable energies. Uh, so it could be um, photovoltaics, it could be wind power, it could be uh, geothermal energy, or it could be hydropower. Um, and it could also be combinations of all of them, of course. Um, then uh, the question is, um, so where would the hydrogen be produced? In what form would it be transported? Uh, how um, are the levelized costs of hydrogen composed if it arrives uh, at the destination in the European Union? Um, what is a part that is due to production of the hydrogen and what is part that is due to shipping of the hydrogen? And how do the costs of um, energy imports from different regions worldwide differ? Um, so if you think about that, there will be a global market emerging, then of course you will not only um, buy from the cheapest producer, but there will be a market emerging and many of those potential producers uh, will have a chance to supply hydrogen uh, to Europe in the far, far future. Uh, and I think we have to see that um, there are different um, regions worldwide that are basically autark with respect to energy, but it's very unlikely that the European Union will be in this position. So um, I already uh, look, uh, illustrated here which countries might be interesting. Uh, so uh, Northern Africa, the MENA region is interesting. Australia is interesting. Chile and Argentina have a huge potential and also Canada has a huge potential. All of these countries have very different situations uh, and very different, different technologies, renewable energy technologies that are attractive. Um, particularly there. So if you look um, at uh, the cost composition, how are the levelized cost of um, hydrogen energy carriers composed if you import them from different countries? And here in the, um, in the diagram, you see Chile, Argentina, Canada, Iceland, Namibia, Egypt, and Australia. And you see in detail um, that um, there are different components um, that uh, these costs are composed of. Basically, um, you see that um, first, uh, the production cost of the hydrogen is really the by far largest uh, components, component of the levelized cost. So if you look at a large scale um, hydrogen production, um, somewhere at a very attractive site, and at these very attractive sites, you have um, two and a half times more full load hours than you could realize even in the North Sea in Germany. Um, that makes it very efficient to produce it there and then to transport it because, as you see here, um, the transport overseas is only a very small uh, part of the levelized cost um, that, um, of, of these energy carriers. Um, a, a very large uh, part, of course, is um, the uh, renewable uh, energies, oops, sorry, is the renewable energies uh, that you need to produce it. Um, and a large part is the electrolysis plant. That's the yellow part here um, in the diagram. And um, then transport inland and transport overseas is the gray and the black part. And you see that this is a minor part of uh, the overall production cost of renewable hydrogen or hydrogen-based energy carriers. If you look at a comparison of these different countries, uh, then you see um, that um, the levelized cost of hydrogen are very different uh, for different uh, regions where you uh, import it from. So for example, Namibia is quite a bit more expensive than, for example, Canada. And this is due to the fact that in Canada, you have 8,760 hours of um, water power, of hydropower, whereas in Namibia, you have renewable power plants and you need to invest wind and solar in order to get enough full load hours in order to, um, to um, run the electro uh, uh, 
uh, in order to run the electrolysis part effectively. So for the electrolyzer, typically it's very important that it runs all time or almost all time. And therefore you have to build up a very extensive renewable energy park, for example, in Namibia. So let's see. Okay, so um, putting this together, um, you see that uh, in the end, we will have an energy system in the European Union that is first composed of a um, part of the energy, energy system that goes for electrification, where we are, um, uh, where we have to develop uh, the electricity markets such that we expand renewables massively, that we build the networks in order to transport the renewable electricity to where it is uh, needed. Um, and this is a big challenge because we have not enough um, network capacity yet. And um, this is also a challenge uh, to the market design, especially in the current energy crisis. Uh, there's a lot of debate on adaption of the electricity market design um, such that prices are now immediately lower. But of course, we have to account for the fact that this, of course, affects investment incentives in generation capacity massively um, because no private investors and we have um, private firms active in electricity generation, no private investor will build a plant in this very uncertain situation where it's not clear uh, what are the pricing rules that I will face on these electricity markets in the future. Um, so that's one part uh, of the electricity system. And the other part is uh, this um, molecule-based um, electricity or energy system where you um, certainly have, will have a mixture uh, between imports of renewable energies in the form of hydrogen or hydrogen carriers. So we evaluated various um, ammonia as one, um, then you can liquefy hydrogen, then you can uh, import hydrogen um, bound to liquid organic hydrogen carriers. That's basically an oil where you can, um, uh, to, to which you can bind uh, the hydrogen molecule, transport it, and then you can um, decouple the hydrogen from the oil at the um, at the um, destination and use the oil again for another cycle of transport. Um, and you see here the bars, for example, for Canada, uh, you see that here um, you have uh, different possibilities. Uh, LHC is liquid um, hydrogen. Um, this one, this bar um, with H8 dBT, uh, that that's uh, this liquid um, hydrogen carrier. That's an oil where you that you use in order to transport hydrogen. Um, then you can transport hydrogen in form of methanol, and you can transport hydrogen in form of fischer tropsch diesel. So these are all different possibilities to import hydrogen to the European Union. Um, to import gaseous hydrogen, uh, you need a pipeline. Basically, this is not shippable. Uh, so um, either you liquefy or make an e-fuel out of it and uh, transport it by ship, or uh, you uh, transport the gas, but then you need, of course, a pipeline, and it's not possible to, um, to, to, to build a pipeline from every possible uh, region worldwide, but only from regions that are close uh, to central uh, continental Europe, for example, from Scotland or from Norway, or also from African countries in the south of Europe, it would also be um, thinkable. Um, so what our current research agenda is on is to uh, look at models that couple, that look at the coupled energy system. Um, so on the one hand, the electricity system, on the other hand, uh, this um, gas-based um, sector that is, um, basically composed of two sectors in the short run, namely of gas and the corresponding network and of hydrogen and the corresponding network. And also here, you can of course uh, look at um, these markets and uh, the energy systems in electricity market models where you try to model the network um, capacities on the one hand, but also on the markets um, that are run in order to trade 
um, the commodities on the other hand. And uh, for gas markets, that's, that's um, a little bit more complicated because the modeling of gas networks it is a little bit more complicated. And also the markets, the gas market works uh, under different rules than the electricity market. But nevertheless, um, this is something that um, one would like to understand in order to uh, understand what are the incentives of firms to engage in these markets and supply um, the um, energy that we need, um, either in form of electricity or in form of um, molecules, gas or hydrogen um, based carriers. Um, one last word, maybe, um, because I mentioned it on the first slide uh, with respect to the environment, to the basically fiscal environment in which we are at the moment and in which we um, face all these challenges, because we face a massive challenge to redesign um, our electricity system in Europe in a very heterogeneous situation. Uh, first, with respect to the um, energy systems in all European countries. So we have various different situations. In France, for example, we have a situation where uh, that is based mainly on nuclear power. In Germany, uh, we counted on cheap gas from Russia, which uh, was a big mistake, basically, to become so dependent on Russia with respect to the electricity um, sector and also with respect to the energy sector in general. So it's not electricity that is most dependent, it's more heat and industry that is very dependent on Russian gas. Um, in other countries, um, the system is still very much coal based and there will have to be a massive reinvestment, for example, in Poland, in order to uh, reshape uh, the electricity system. So this will be a real um, challenge and endeavor to drive us into a sustainable future. Um, and um, at the same time, we face a very challenging fiscal situation in the European Union. So basically, uh, that's now in German. So uh, at the left hand side, um, um, this is interest payments. Um, of different countries and uh, the dark blue is Germany, um, then the uh, orange is France, um, the, um, the green one is it Italy, and the light blue is Spain. So we see that in the last 20 years, oh, sorry, in the last 20 years, interest payments will be going down, we're increasing again in the financial crisis, uh, but we're going down uh, in the years after the financial crisis. But in Italy and France, we see an upwards trend again today. Um, and this is uh, because uh, Italy and France have um, a lot of inflation indexed bonds, um, which was thought to be a good idea, but actually in an inflationary environment, it's not. Um, so this might um, pose a major challenge. And uh, in the German Council of Economic Experts, we um, just uh, studied the question of what happens to uh, the, um, what happens to the interest payments um, that have to be made by uh, the four major uh, Euro economies, Germany, France, uh, Italy, Spain, uh, which is depicted here um, on the right hand side. And you see that um, the dark blue line in every graph, um, for example, here uh, for Italy, the dark blue line is uh, the interest payments of Italy um, during uh, the financial, in the aftermath of the financial crisis, um, which went down thereafter um, until today. And now we are in a situation where the interest payments are uh, rising, in particular um, due to the expectation at the market that the ECB will raise interest rates. And we see that um, the financial situation of the countries in the euro area can worsen. So. The current um, yield curve that um, the market is facing is uh, the orange one. So we see that currently, if nothing, nothing more happens, which is not the most likely case, I would say, then um, the payments would stabilize at the current level, 
in all the affected countries or all the depicted countries here. But if the interest rates increase even more than the current level, then we see uh, that also the interest payments in the different um, countries of the Euro, Euro area would rise. And in some country, interest payments would become higher than at the time of the financial crisis. So um, of the euro crisis. So uh, we see um, that fiscal sustainability. So the question: um, What is the situation of the uh, of the um, uh, of the um, public finances in the different countries? Will be a very important question. Uh, in particular, um, if we see that climate um, policy will be something that we have to continue for quite some years and all the member states of the European Union will have to be in the position um, that they can um, support that they are they, they, that they stay always in the situation that they can support uh, climate policy so I think we have to uh, think a lot about um, the right framework to mobilize private investment uh, in particular uh, CO2 pricing infrastructure expenditure um, and um, in particular, what is also important, of course, is certification. Um, what is, uh, so what counts as green? Uh, what um, power counts as green and what energy carriers that we import in the future are uh, considered as green energy carriers? Um, most um, beneficial it would be to focus on the CO2 footprint of energy carriers in order to really incentivize firms to um, reduce energy um, CO2 footprints and uh, contribute in their self-interest to a climate neutral economy. So basically, um, that's a little overview um, of what um, I've been doing uh, in my research and also how relevant I think it is um, for policy. Uh, so we started at electricity market modeling with a focus on investment incentives. Um, we tried to understand long run developments uh, necessary for climate neutral future. And at the moment, we try to understand sector coupled energy market markets in order to understand how we should shape the framework conditions in order to um, mobilize investment worldwide um, that contributes to a climate neutral uh, Europe. So thank you. I hope I didn't overstretch it and I'm happy to discuss. Thank you very much. That was very interesting. We have one question in the chat. Adam, if you just want to ask it. Outspoken, oh, spoke. Sorry, spoken. Yeah, yeah. Um, that's that's fine. Yeah, uh, thank you so uh, so much. So um, really interesting. I should say I work on in the energy ministry in the UK. Uh, so this is uh, the reason for my asking, um, and specifically on electricity market design. Um, so so I'm particularly interested in the the uh, renewable investment decisions modeling, the network build model. And my my question was. Um, your model, like what, what are the constraints on how much network can be built and where it can be built by the regulator? Um, and also what constraints are there on where generation assets can be built? Like in the UK, we have quite significant issues both on network and on generation around planning and land use um, mm -hmm. and also supply chain issues um, and labor supply issues of where you can physically uh, build additional network or build new assets. Uh, so as, and and the the case that I can see for locational pricing or nodal pricing is mostly about, as you say, like inducing more optimal locations of of, of these things. But if there's real world constraints that mean we can't actually do this um, within the within the current, like there's maybe no point to doing the, the market reform. So I was just wondering how, how, like in Germany, whether this is also an issue and how the model handles uh, these these issues. Mm -hmm. um, so um, first in the model, uh, what we can implement is um, the um, is um, line candidates. So what um, and and then typically the model could um, uh, could be calibrated to um, to depict a certain situation. For example, for Germany, uh, we looked at the line candidates. 
uh, that were proposed in the context of the German network development plan. So uh, there were already by uh, this process uh, was a proposal of possible line candidates and there was a big debate uh, which of these line candidates to build and in the model we could calibrate the model as to reflect exactly the situation and the line candidates were then candidates that were um, optional in the model and were built depending on uh, the actual uh, calibration so that's how we uh, model it you have candidates um, that then the model builds or does not build depending on uh, endogenously basically um, in uh, the context of uh, restrictions, of course, um, I think this is something that is also relevant if you calibrate these models. I, I mean, um, the more complicated the model is, um, and what we are doing is to um, decompose all these decisions and implement them, them at different stages. So you have this investment stage where the regulator is uh, taking the decision and the market stage um, where the private uh, firms take the decision. And um, this um, multi-level structure, of course, restricts the complexity that you can depict when you calibrate the model. So you cannot make it as big as you want. What we do is then to simplify uh, the transmission network and, for example, uh, look at 20 or 30 nodes in Germany. Um, or sometimes also less in order to illustrate something and in, in, uh, if we, for example, do a calibration in order to complement a scientific paper where we develop the model and then we calibrate it just in order to illustrate what it's for. Um, and um, then um, when calibrating it, um, of course, you can account for all these restrictions, how much potential is there for gas turbines, um, um, how much land potential is there, how much, uh, uh, how much, uh, how is the wind profile in different, at different network nodes that you can, um, uh, that you can um, assume at a certain network node, and what is uh, the potential of a certain wind class, so to say, at this network node. So this is, these are things that, of course, uh, one could extract from data and uh, calibrate the model with. Um, and uh, basically, the more market issues you try to, be, to, to put into the model, uh, the less accurate you are on an electricity level. So, of course, uh, optimization uh, models uh, can be much more finer um, because you just have the optimization stage and not these multi-level structure. Well, I, I do have a question there. Um, so, thank you very much for your talk, first of all. Um, and since you, you named the uh, lobbying, uh, like I wanted to ask you, like, well, like, what are the forces that at the moment are uh, you know, being an obstacle or vice versa, a driver of change uh, in designing these uh, new networks uh, and, you know, this uh, uh, energy mix, that more than an energy mix is, a, you know, a sort of, uh, you know, means of delivering the energy, which uh, should be electricity mix, etc. So how much is the lobbying, you know, for or against uh, uh, hydrogen or in general, like the passage to these, uh, you know, uh, new type of network uh, that uh, is being designed? Um, I think uh, there are different discussions uh, that makes it, make it very challenging. Um, one is uh, certainly that there are very different perspectives um, how the mix between um, electrons and molecules should look like. So some uh, think that um, for example, hydrogen should only um, be used for uh, the um, sectors where you cannot electrify and others um, promote um, to just um, let, let the providers basically decide uh, what is a good economic solution. Um, and I think what is, um, what is not so clear from the whole electricity uh, sector modeling is um, what um, one or the other um, energy system 
what one or the other energy systems imp impact is on um, the industry structure in the European Union, because um, basically to a large part is it's industrial um, um, of takers that need hydrogen and fuels. And um, on the other hand, uh, there is a lot of industry in Europe that could um, provide machinery applications um, so, so that could um, provide um, all the um, uh, machines applications for these new value chains. And this is something uh, that is not thought through a lot. So uh, there is maybe, if you look at um, the very, um, from a climate perspective, optimistic scenarios, I think um, it is too, there are two little studies that look at what is um, the economy that we have then left. Um, because we just need in order to um, in order to um, to get a climate policy going, I think we need a perspective for all the people uh, that live in our economies and that want work and so on. Um, and I think the impact on the in the industrial production on, and on value creation of one or the other um, energy system, uh, this is something that we have too little research on up to now. Um, so of course, um, one could imagine a world where um, everyone in Europe has a very low CO2 footprint, uh, but the question is whether uh, everyone still have, would have work, whether we would lose a lot of um, our industry, what the position of Europe in the world would, would be. There's now the new geopolitical discussion um, on uh, the new blocks uh, in the geopolitical game. And I think it's very important for Europe to also be a strong player in the future um, world economy um, in order to have some impact also on geopolitical um, issues. Um, so there is a lot of um, um, lobbying going on in very different directions. I think this is something um, that uh, has to be better understood what is um, actually particular interests of, for example, industry or of um, a certain environmental group and what is a good idea from an overall perspective, um, looking at the economy and um, also on uh, the possibility to implement, um, to go a, a certain uh, direction um, in a democratic system. Uh, another issue um, that, uh, I think is um, very challenging right now is that we have too much of a short-term perspective. So there is now the energy crisis, and um, there's a lot of um, there's a lot of action taking in order to reduce energy prices. Um, but uh, we don't see two issues in this context. Uh, one issue is that, of course, if I reduce energy prices of fossil fuels, then I disincentivize um, the change to renewables, then I still keep fossil fuels attractive. Um, and the second issue is uh, if I now reduce, for example, energy prices, then it's good for um, the uh, competitiveness of firms, it's good for uh, the purses of the people at the moment, uh, but it's very bad for investment incentives. If I now um, make uh, uh, if I now establish the belief that energy prices will uh, be low, uh, probably even below uh, marginal costs of the uh, marginal plant, then why to invest? And uh, this um, leads into an um, energy system where in the end, uh, the governments have more and more the role um, of the investor in, for example, generation capacity, which is not anymore a liberalized uh, electricity market, um, which becomes a problem, of course, if it comes to the budgets, uh, the public budgets. And of course, at some point in time, then we need a decision whether we still want to have a liberalized electricity market or not. 
Yeah, touching on this, so on the on the spatial part of the allocation of uh, the location of industry. So you you named essentially inside of our outside the European Union, but I can think that also inside of the European Union, you may be willing to relocate your industry potentially uh, closer to where uh, it's easier to transport energy, for example, closer to the coast if we need to deliver a shoe there or you know, closer to where it's generated uh, uh, with renewable energy, for example, Southern Europe. So uh, there is also a, you know, a matter of, you know, uh, relocation once you design the new market, once you see the new prices, you know, across space, but even, you know, close by, but this may, may mean a huge sort of uh, uh, displacement for local workers for, uh, um, so I do you think that we should, you know, think about these and how should policymakers think about these, uh, Spatial components where we see today a certain location of work as an industry, but this may change in the new equilibrium. Um, yeah, I think we should uh, look at this. I, I think models are a good way to look at what would happen if we let it happen. Yeah, it's not clear that uh, policy let policymakers would let it happen, uh, but in models, of course, you see um, the relocation potential of industry. Um, on the one hand, out, to, to, to locations outside the European Union, but also within the European Union, of course, um, the incentives to locate industry plants have changed dramatically um, with um, uh, renewables um, evolving. And I think this is something important. Uh, it's uh, certainly challenging for some regions, but I think uh, we should also in the European Union um, try to realize benefits that come with it. Um, for example, uh, in the case of hydrogen production, um, it need not come with the relocation of workers, but it could also um, bring value creation to locations that, that need growth um, and value creation at the moment. Um, if you look, for example, at Spain, at Italy, uh, I think it would be very important to also um, to also um, use the growth potential that comes with uh, these potential investments in order to overcome uh, the potential fiscal um, challenges uh, that I showed in the last slide. Basically, um, one solution to uh, this fish, fiscal challenge is growth. Um, and um, I think this is very important. I think um, the potential to, um, uh, I, my impression is uh, that the potential to uh, safeguard industries uh, where they are now is not so big. Um, so we will certainly in the different uh, countries in the European Union select some where we say they are very important and uh, we subsidize uh, them in order to still have them uh, in our country, possibly where they are now, uh, but we will not be able to do this with all the um, industry that we have now. For example, in Germany, um, I think it's very clear that the um, ammonia production as part of the chemical industry will relocate um, at the minimum within Germany, but I think um, also that we will import a large part of a much larger part of our ammonia supply um, from countries worldwide because it's so it's so natural. We have already ammonia trade. It's so much cheaper to uh, produce ammonia at locations where I have cheap renewable hydrogen and. Uh, low population density, so the probability that uh, ammonia trade will increase is very high. Uh, 